It's not a reaction. I, be, I believe God laid this upon my heart because what we just had happen in America that would cause our forefathers to roll over in their graves in the establishment of our country um, was, was something that has been a development over years and years and years, decades. And it's nothing new. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, Solomon said that things come and go, uh, ideas, sin, every kind of thing that you can imagine is always the same. And it stems back as a matter of introduction to Genesis chapter 3. And I'd like you to turn there. The very first man and woman named Adam and Eve, uh, they were real. This is not a saga. This is not a story. Uh, they can be traced all the way back. Uh, it is, it, this is not, this is genealogy. We've gone back and people that, that are into that know that this is a true story. It is not, a, not just some uh, cunningly devised fable as the Bible says. Uh, it is a biblical account of the very first man and the very first woman and a choice they made which forever had a far-reaching effect on you and I and the choices that we make and so what the decisions that we had, though appalling, in our nation, and you may have a different, you may, you, you may be in this service, and you may have a, a totally different perspective of that, and you have a right to, um, to express that, but the fact of the matter is, is God is the final authority. Whether you believe it or not is not the issue, and Genesis chapter 3 addresses the title of the message this day, When Man Becomes His Own God. When Man Becomes His Own God. Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says, Now the serpent, one of God's creations, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the, the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Satan had entered into the serpent, and he is speaking through the servant, if, this, this snake, the serpent, to Eve. And Adam is believed to have been standing right there. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God, now look at this, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall be as gods, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now let me explain what, was, what just has been said and what just happened. Who, is, who spoke that? God? Satan. So, a lot of people get the impression that what happened is when they ate the fruit that they had an understanding, a clear understanding of the same thinking God had in relation to sin. But that's not true. What happened is their understanding of good and evil became man's own understanding of good and evil and the reaction that they had towards God because of the sin that they had done and what they had done explains that their thinking now was totally different. Satan had lied to them and he had told them both the woman was deceived, and in the transgression, the Bible says later on in the New Testament, but man willingly sinned against God. Man knew volitionally what he was doing, and he chose to listen to that lie. Wow, if I could just become my own God, then I would know good and evil, then I don't need God anymore. But the sad thing is, what he didn't realize is he would need God more than he ever did because of his sin. And so, it continues the story. 
Verse 6 says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And when they heard the voice of the Lord walking, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God, or the Lord God, amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9, And the Lord called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee? that thou wast naked. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? What would a godly response be to that question? Yes, I did. It's called confession of your sins. He that confesseth and forsaketh his sins shall have mercy. But what did he say? There is no acknowledgement of his sin. Here's what he says. The, woman, the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, and gave of, gave me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. It's her fault. Well, sin's a learned behavior. It's a continuation, and it, and it doesn't change. Verse 13, and the Lord God said unto the woman, now he turns to Eve, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. It's not my fault, it's his fault. Well, the serpent didn't have any other, other place to go. And so God starts backwards now, goes to the serpent. He says, you're going to crawl in your belly and eat the dust of the earth all the rest of your life. Eve, you're going to have problems, you're going to have pain in childbirth and and bring children to the world with great travail, and any of you that have had a child, you've experienced that. Did that come true? Was that true? Yes or no? Unless you had an epidural. You had an epidural, you copped out on God, okay? <laughs> All right? Then, at the end, he got to man, and he said, you're going to work by the sweat of your face. The ground is going to yield not like it used to. It's going to have thorns and thistles and it's not going to be the same. And God drove them out of the garden and they never got back. He posted angels at every entrance. They were on their own. Now go back to our text, Romans chapter 1, and you're going to see that we're, we're in that same position. When man becomes his own God, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He makes his own rules. And there are very specific things that we see in this text that are no surprise because truly our society is a reflection of of man becoming his own God. We in America, for years in the public schools and on our colleges, have subliminally and sometimes very openly and vocally been taught humanism. It is a religion. If you study the, the educators of the world, I've, I've knocked on some of the doors of some of those players since I have been here for 13 years, some of which were involved in decisions at John Muir Park in, or John Muir Woods in San Francisco. I'm talking about people that were world leaders, people that were looking to shape and reshape the thinking processes of not only the American people, but the world, to their way of thinking. Because if you're God, not only do you make the rules, but you want control. And so, <clears throat> first, what happens when man becomes God? First of all, he rejects and changes 
truth. Look in verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, that means all wickedness, by the way, not just homosexuality, all wickedness. Don't be shocked and don't be so disturbed that we legalized that, that practice of life and marriage. I'm not for it. I'm against it wholeheartedly. Don't believe in it. I believe it is sin. But don't be shocked just because of one sin, one issue that has been legalized and the permission that has been given for people to do that because our government has been continued to do that throughout our society with all kinds of sin. Drinking, drunkenness. We in Washington have the loosest laws for driving drunk. You can drive drunk and kill somebody and spend minimal time in jail in the United States. But see, that's just a social thing. That's just a, a, a regular thing. And people don't even think about that because we, we advertise it with sports. We advertise it on every, kind of, uh, on every corner. And, and, every, and, we, and we voted as a society. We even voted for marijuana. Because, I mean, it's really good for you. I mean, it, it does, you know, has, forget the effects. Forget trying to police it. Forget all of that. But we, we've le the government is all about making people feel happy because that makes them vote for them. They don't care about morality. They don't care about you. They care about power. And those that are in power make the rules. And so when man becomes God, he rejects and changes truth. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The word hold means to suppress. And we were all, we were all shocked and, and, and many people rocked to the core because one woman by the name of Madeline Murray O'Hare decided that she didn't want the Bible in school. Well, where's the, where was the Bible at home? Why, why, I mean, why, why, if you didn't have the Bible in school, why, why would that change a society? It was a rejection of the public schools to truth. But then they rewrote truth and they changed truth. We went from believing in creationism, which was what was taught in public school at the beginning of our country to changing truth and embracing evolution, which was a theory, still is a theory, and last I checked, real science doesn't accept theory as truth, but we do in the United States of America. When man becomes God, he rejects truth, and then he changes truth. Go to verse 25. Verse 25 says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. When man becomes God, he actually begins to believe in perverted truth. Paul said to the Galatian church, I marvel that you are so soon removed unto another gospel, which is not another but there would be some that would pervert or change the gospel. Why in the United States, a country that was established for religious freedom by predominantly Christian people who came here to be able to preach salvation by grace through faith and to believe like we believe now, because they were being persecuted first in England, then in Holland, and they risked their lives on the Mayflower and a few other ships to come here to try to find a place where they could be, be able to worship and not be, not be persecuted. So they came to the United States establishing a gospel preaching nation. But why in America are there so many different truths? Well, part of it is 
how many times this has changed. This book is being perverted on a weekly basis. A weekly basis. Just go to a Christian bookstore and just look at how many different versions or perversions of Scripture that there are. How many times can you translate a book and keep the purity of it? How many times? 10? 20? 30? 40? Did you know that to copyright anything that you have to change at least 10%? Do you want 10% rewritten? This is God's word and doesn't need to be tampered with. God gives very strong admonitions to those who add or take away from it. And so we need to understand that the truth, what God said, it, the, it God claims for itself with the Word of God that it's always been and always will be. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. There has been a copy of the Word of God along with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there has been a written copy of everything that they, that they wrote in here. It has been and always will be. It is their, if you will, their mission statement as the Godhead. Why would you change it? This book has been, has, has been perverted. People do not want to embrace the truth. So what they do is they change it. They either alter the, the written word or they alter it by what they decide to say and what they decide to think. Have you ever heard this statement? Well, you just got to do what's best for you. That sounds really fuzzy, warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? But guess what? That's exactly what Satan told them in the garden. And they've been doing that, what's best for them, for ever since but it it's, it's funny it always it doesn't ever work out that way it never works out what's best for you unless you do what God wants you to do it never works out best so first they change truth and reject truth number two when man becomes his own God he worships whoever and however he chooses to Go to verse 23 and 25. Romans 1, 23 says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Just travel the world, and you will see this. Images of world leaders. No different than Nebuchadnezzar who put a 90-foot statue up and commanded the whole country of, of the empire, Babylonian Empire said, you are going to worship this or you are going to be cast into a fiery furnace. And you're going to worship with my music. So he played music. Everybody bowed but three young men. And I believe Daniel. Daniel was out, you know, Daniel was, this was, Daniel wrote the book of Daniel, and Daniel, I, I think God, the Holy Spirit, allowed him to be written out of the story, because it wasn't about Daniel, it was about those three men and their stand. They could have chosen to be like everybody else, but they said, don't think so. We know who our God is, we know what we believe. And they told Nebuchadnezzar this. They said, Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. And he will, O king. But if not, we will not bow to your image or worship the golden image that thou hast set up. They were thrown into the fiery furnace Nothing hurt them, nothing touched them. And when Nebuchadnezzar looked in the furnace, he looked and he said, 
Did not we cast three into the fiery furnace? Lo, I see four men walking in that furnace. There were four men walking. The fourth was the son, and they said the fourth is like the Son of God. The Lord Jesus was there with them. And so, but man, when he becomes his own God, just makes he makes up his own worship. So he'll worship a rock. Here in this area, uh, when you drive around, you'll every once in a while you'll see rocks, and they're they're stacked up. You see that in Hawaii a lot. And and, and it, it's kind of decorative. And you think, oh, well, you know, somebody's just having fun and they're just, you know, they're just kind of making, rearranging rocks. No. They are setting up a, a God to worship. Countries all across the world are worshiping gold and silver and wood and stone. And they're worshiping idols. But you know what the biggest idol is? Self. You, you, yourself. When you and I get to the place that we make ourselves God, and it's subtle, it's very subtle. We think we know better than God. We think we know more than God. And so we decide, eh, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it that way. God, I, you know, I, I appreciate your thoughts, but I got a better idea. David tried that with the ark. You so say, what do you mean? They were bringing the ark back from the Philistines. And the ark was supposed to be carried on two staves through rings that were molded onto the ark of the covenant. The most sacred piece of furniture in the Jewish tabernacle and, at, and also in the temple. And God made very clear in the law, nobody puts their hand on that ark and touches it. Do you know why? Because that's where the Shekinah glory of God, the, the cloud that rested on top, that cloud that one time a year manifested himself, God himself, in a, in a theophany, a, a manifestation of God in a form because God is spirit and no man has seen God at any time, the Bible says. He manifested himself to the high priest once a year over that. And nobody was to touch it. So David said, I have a good idea. You know, God, um, you have, you've, you've had men carrying that but this is a modern day. This is a new day. I'm going to put it on a cart. It's a long ways from there to, to the, where, you know, the, the tabernacle. So back to where we, you know, we worship. So I'm going to put it on a cart, and I'm going to have a couple men ride on the cart. You know, I mean, everything technology, right? So there's a man whose name is Uzzah who's riding on that cart. The Ark of the Covenant is behind him, and the cart hits a bump, and the Ark starts to go off, and Uzzah reaches to touch, hold, to stop it from falling because he doesn't want it to hit the ground, and God strikes him dead. Immediately strikes him dead. DRT, dead right there. And David gets upset at God. And God says, I make the rules, not you. And the Bible says David feared God for what he had done. And David then went back and he, they, they got the staves through the rings and they began to worship how God wanted them worshiping. When man becomes his own God, he worships whoever and whatever and however he chooses. Jesus came to the woman at the well. And she says, we know what we worship. We worship in, and, and Jesus said, salvations of the Jews. She said, well, when Messiah cometh, he'll let us, and he says, I'm he. You're talking to him. Right now. And Jesus made a statement. He says, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Meaning that 
It's a spiritual thing, and it's a truth thing. There are a lot of things that have been established, a lot of religions, right here in the United States, quite frankly. Some which only have dated 100 years. Why, and I, I've always asked, when they come to my door, I've always asked them the question, why do I need to embrace what you believe when your religion is only a little over 100 years old, when what I believe has no beginning? Because it's always been and it always will be because it's established on the Godhead. It's established from the Word of God, from Christ. And they have nothing to say. First, when man becomes God, he rejects and changes truth. That's So what we saw yes, a couple of days ago wasn't, wasn't, wasn't a surprise. The Bible says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's just, let's just put it in perspective. The Roman government was ten times more open with homosexuality and perversion, sexual sin, than America would ever dream of. We, we are a restrained society, and thank God, okay? We, if you think what we saw, that's bad? Well, yeah, it's going to open up some doors, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to get different. It's going to be way different, and it's going to be uncomfortable. But Jesus and the disciples ministered in a day and ministered in a time that there was no holds barred. And you can't even talk today. The Bible says it's a shame to, the, a shame to speak of those things which were done to them in secret. But yet the gospel flourished. And people got saved. You know why? Because Paul, in the beginning of this text, says, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. And then he writes this. He says, for therein, therein what? In the gospel, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. If you're looking for righteousness to be revealed, for you to define and, or to, to figure out and to determine what morality is based upon the government, you're kidding yourself. Because they have no concept of righteousness. Righteousness begins at God. And it will never be, you, you, this society is never going to be righteous without God. And so men, when man becomes his own God, he rejects and changes truth. He worships, worships whoever and however he wants to. And then he develops his own sense of morality. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Not only do they hold down the truth, the reason they hold down the, the truth, the reason they suppress truth is they have their own form of morality and they don't want to be told what to do. It's anarchism. It's I'm not going to listen to anybody because the bus buck stops with me. I make the rules. I don't have to listen to you. Any of you raised children and had maybe some tragedy, probably had a child look to you and say, I don't have to listen to what you say. And I won't. It's tragic. But where does that stem from? It stems from back in the garden. Satan promised them, you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You'll be able to do whatever you choose to. You know what? Here's the thing, though. You can make that choice, but you cannot determine the consequences of those choices. That's in God's hands. And that they don't care about. And we'll get into that in just a minute. First, he rejects truth and he changes truth. They, and then second, he worships whoever and however. Number three, he develops his own sense of morality. They call good evil and evil good. That's exactly what happened. When they fell in the garden, 
what was evil to God was now good to them. What was good to them was evil to God. And that's our society. Sounds pretty simplistic, but that's our society. Everything to somebody in America is good. A child molester to him, that's good. A harlot to her, that's good. A drunkard to him, that's good. A homosexual to them, that's good. By the way, it's, it's so interesting to me that they use a rainbow. One of our kids looked up and when we were out playing games, I, 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 I get the good job at Vacation Bible School. So I sing the songs and then I go out and I get to play. You know, we do games and so forth. And one of the kids looked up and says, a rainbow! And so I asked, I said, where's that? You know, where, who, who made the rainbow? God made the rainbow. And I said, what was it? It was a promise. What was the promise? That he would never flood the earth again. It's interesting that a group of immoral, evil, wicked people have embraced a symbol that relates to a promise of no judgment. Isn't that interesting? The rainbow was a sign that God would no longer flood the earth, but that was just a flood. In the New Testament, the Bible says the next time, because that, he didn't promise he wasn't ever going to destroy the earth. He only promised he wouldn't destroy it with a flood. Right. He is promised in First and Second Peter, he is promised that the next time it's going to be by fire, and this everything in this world is going to be burnt to toast. It's going to melt with fervent heat. There won't be another earth. So we're not coming back, by the way, to earth, to anything that is in existence like we see now. Nothing. That's a promise. When man becomes his own God, he de develops his own sense of morality. So, Cain sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Akuna matata. <laughs> what a wonderful phrase. Akuna matata. All the movies of our kids. And look, I, I, I don't have against kids watching cartoons. I'm out of stuff. I love my, my kids like fantasy, and we teach them to, oh, to look through all that kind of stuff. We, we cannot become a society which takes all the fun out of things for children. We teach them, we train them, we show them truth so they can make their own choices and their decisions. But we have to teach them that a kuna matata isn't real life, and the case sera sera isn't real life. It's your head's in the sand. It's fantasy. It's never, never land. The, the, the happiest place on earth, Disneyland. I went there. <laughs> I'm going there again this year. My grandkids go there twice a year. My sister, she has season tickets, and if she misses a week, that's a tragedy. Between that and Hawaii, it's a tragedy. And Denise, if you're hearing this tape, that's fine, okay? I'm just giving you a hard time, okay? Anyway, when man becomes God, he develops his own sense of morality, but he also puts God out of his mind. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. By the way, that's why the public schools said no Bible. And why they now are teaching in the workplace. Don't talk about religion. 
because we don't want to hear it. Everybody has something they believe, and so just, just don't talk about any of it because we don't want to be reminded that there is a God. Why would we want that? Because that would be just a horrible thing to think about God. We can teach kids to think about whatever they want to think about, good or bad, but we can't teach them to think about who made them, their creator, and what he can do for them, and how wonderful life would be if they would have a personal relationship with him. Don't want to, have any, don't want to even retain him in his knowledge. So that's why when, when you go and you knock doors here in this area, it says, don't want to hear anything religious. Gave it the office. Don't talk to me. Don't bother me. Because I'm not going there. We live in an atheistic, agnostic, amoral society. What is, what's, what's the awe mean? In atheistic. What's the awe in amoral? What's the awe in agnostic? Nothing. No God. The Bible says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You know why? Because in verse number 21 it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. God has put himself, an awareness of himself, in the hearts of every man. They know there's a God. They choose not to retain him in their knowledge. They choose to not believe because they're worshiping someone else. They're worshiping themselves. When man becomes his own God, he puts God out of his mind. The last thing, and this is staggering, he disregards God's judgment. I don't know when God is going to bring judgment. I do not know when the Lord is going to come. But I know that America, like any other nation, will not get by with sin. And the direction we are going as a nation is no different than Rome. Rome imploded from within. There was no enemy that was strong enough or powerful enough. Rome was considered to be the, the image that was set up. The, the, the feet were of iron. That meant that though they were the most perverted of all empires, they were the strongest of all empires militarily. But they imploded from within. And by the way, we are very, very close to imploding as a nation from within. So a lot of talk about millennials. And people have just thought, ah, you know, we've had the baby boomers and, we, and then there was the X, the Generation X, and, and now it's the millennials. And, we just, and we've heard all these newfangled names and things, you know, for, and, and, but, here, but, but get this. Do you know who the millennials are? The millennials are the young people who aren't in church, predominantly. They left the church that now are making the six figures. They're the new baby boomers. They're the ones that are they're the high tech. They're the intellectuals. They're the ones that are, are ultimately going to be the leaders of our nations. And folks, they're embracing everything. Even, even in politics. I heard one the other day on the news, I was staggered. There's no difference, Republican, Democrat anymore. Not with the millennials. And, there, and, and there's no difference with independent, with the millennials. They, they all believe the same thing. Because they're the most selfish, self-serving generation we have ever seen in our country. Because they are self-absorbed. It's all self-serving. It's all about me. It's an, entitlement, it's an entitlement society. 
And so what's happened is we, we have come to the place where we, we now disregard judgment. Well, nothing's going to happen to me. Look at what God says. He lists all kinds of sins. By the way, it's not just homosexuality. You, you can see, verse 26, For this cause God gave them over unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use of, into that which was against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the women, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their ear which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then he lists all the things. It's not just homosexuality God's going to judge. God burns Sodom off the face of the map for wickedness. He said, the wickedness cries up to me. But they weren't just, it wasn't just the perversion and the digression of homosexuality. It was all sin. And everybody in Sodom that stayed died. Everybody. Now look at verse 32 and we'll close. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. There are lots of professing Christians it's pretty disgusting when you hear somebody that's involved in immoral like um, on Fox yesterday a Christian homosexual. There is no such thing. A Christian harlot. There is no such thing. A Christian drunkard. There is no such thing. Change is what Jesus expected. And that's where we need to be as a, as a church. That's where we need to be as God's people. Is we, need to, we need to be about reaching one soul at a time. It isn't let you, you're not going to legislate yourself into morality. It's not going to happen. If you're depending on the Supreme Court, you're depending upon the Congress, you're depending upon the Senate, you're depending upon the State Senate and the, and the State House, you're, you're depending upon the governors and the mayors and all the, the, the political leaders. Don't kid yourself. They could care less. It's all about votes. I'm not saying there aren't some good politicians. But it's all about votes. The only thing that's going to change this world is a revival with the Lord Jesus. That's it. We need to love people. We need to care about souls. We don't need to be Sin bashers. Jesus did not do that. His message was, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. He didn't tolerate sin. He didn't excuse sin. He told people to change from where they were and to get out of sin. But he loved people and he didn't condemn people. And so, if we would learn to bite our tongue and love people, Maybe we'll reach some. Maybe we'll reach some of the homosexuals. Maybe we'll reach some of those that are involved in sexual sin. Maybe we'll, re we'll reach some of those involved in, in drugs and alcohol and, and all kinds of other... Maybe we'll reach some liars. Maybe we'll reach some gossips. Maybe we'll... Maybe we'll maybe, you know, I mean, there's just all the things. There's, it's more than just those sins. We major on all these sins. Sin is sin in the heart, eyes of God. And all of it is going to be judged. When man becomes God... Things are not good. Let's ask God to help each of us to be what he wants us to be. Let's stand. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.